Hi, and welcome to CSE 1322. My name is Enda Sullivan. I am one of the instructors in the FYE department, as well as the program coordinator for FYE. Um, I'd like to welcome you to CSE 1322. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to cover some of the topics on how to get started in 1322 and how the course works, what the syllabus looks like, what the grading policies are, and how you can succeed in the class, which is probably what you need. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, so for 1322, most of the content that you need is going to be in this website, CSE, um, sorry, ccse.kennesaw.edu slash FYE. Um, on this website, we store copies of all of the slide, slides that you're looking at, which includes the ones from this presentation, as well as all the labs and assignments that you probably need for your lab section, the free book for the class, which is a PDF, um, the practice exams, information about the IDEs, the office hours for your instructor, all the policies, as well as links to all of these videos that you will use during the class. Now, some of you are in an in-person class and some of you are in an online class. If you're in a section that begins with a W, so you're in like W01, W02, something like that, then that section is a fully online asynchronous class, which means there is no time when you're all going to meet. Um, you're just going to digest these videos at your own time. So generally in the W sections, your instructor will post a message at the beginning of each week and tell you what lessons you need to watch that week. Uh, he'll give you a link, he or she will give you a link to the video and also the PowerPoint presentations for the week and let you know what quizzes are upcoming that week. You'll watch the video, if you have any questions, you'll come to the instructor's office hours, ask your questions or send email to your instructor, and then you'll take your quizzes each week. And then likewise, when we get to the tests, you'll take your tests online. And um, again, if you have any questions or problems along the way, you'll reach out and ask. If you're in an in-person section, then obviously we meet every week in a lecture and uh, these videos are still available to you. Uh, so you have um, both options in that case. Um, if you have to miss a lecture for any reason, you can watch the video or if you just want to go back and relearn something, uh, some of the material is relatively complex, and so you might want to be able to re-watch a lecture on um, the same topic that you have attended in lecture. So that's how all this is going to work. But the important point is that all of the, all of the information that you're going to need for the class is on this website, ccse.kennesaw.edu slash FYE. So I'm just going to give you a quick tour of that site. If you came from 1321 here at Kennesaw, then you're probably very used to this site already because it has all the information for all three of the FYE classes, which are 1300, 1321, and 1322. So over on the left-hand side here, we have the course schedules. So when we click that, that's going to bring you to, um, well, there you go. That's going to bring you to the list of... <laughs> Here we go. It's going to bring you to the list of all of the schedules for the course. So down here you have the 1322 lecture and the 1322 lab schedules. If we pop them open in fall of 22, this is what those uh, look like. And they're going to be slightly different in each semester. But you can see generally it will tell you per week what modules that you're going to be learning. And that's going to tell you what PowerPoints and also what um, videos you might want to watch. And then it tells you what's due the end of that week. So for example, here, the syllabus and policy quiz is due on August 28th. Quiz one is also due on August 28th. And again, if you're watching this in a future semester, make sure you look at the one that's linked on the site because it'll be different every semester. Um, so you're going to live by this uh, document every, every week. You're going to pop it open. You're going to look to see where you are and what's due that week. You're going to have about 10 quizzes. You can see they're listed in here. And you're going to have probably three tests, unless you happen to be watching this in the summer, in which case you'll have two tests. Um, the 10 quizzes make up 25% of your grade, and each of the tests also make up 25% of your grade. So test one is 25%, test two is 25%, and the final exam is also 25%. There's lots more policies with regard to how that grade is calculated, and there's actually a separate video that shows you how the grading is calculated that goes into it in more detail. But the short version is we drop your lowest quiz score. So if you have to miss a quiz any week, that's not the end of the world. It just automatically drops out of your grade, um, but we only drop one. So you only get to do that once during the semester. With regard to the tests, um, if you happen to miss a test, your final exam will replace the test. If you miss the final exam, well, I'm afraid that's, there's nothing we can do for you there. So missing the final exam would be very, very bad. Make sure you don't do that. But for test one and for test two, if you happen to miss them, the final exam will simply replace the zero on there. Also, if you take all three of the exams, which is what you hopefully will do, then if your final exam is higher than the grade that you made on either test one or test two, the final exam will replace 
that great. And we do that because what matters to us most is that at the end of the semester, you know this material. It doesn't really matter that it didn't make sense to you in week seven or that it maybe didn't make sense to you in week 13. All we care is that by the end of the class, you actually do know the material. So the final is cumulative, and as a result, it can replace either of the previous tests if necessary. Um, the other thing to look for on the schedule is uh, any breaks that you might have this semester, since this particular one is a fall. Um, there is a break there for fall break, and you may also have a day off at some point during the semester for other holidays that might be noted down at the bottom here as well. Finally, there's a link down here to the withdrawal date. Um, if you're going to, uh, if you're not doing well in the class and you decide that you want to withdraw, you need to click that link and take a look at the withdrawal dates that are listed on the schedule. So generally, you'll go to the particular semester that you're on, and on that calendar, somewhere midway down, there will be a line that says last day to withdraw without academic penalty. And for this particular semester, that looks like that date right there. So by 11.45 on that day, if you withdraw from the class, you will get a W on your transcript, which doesn't count towards your GPA. If you withdraw after that moment, then you'll get an F on your transcript, which does count a WF. It counts as if it's an F. So make sure that you understand that date. And if you have questions about that, you should talk to your advisor or come talk to the instructor just before class. We can't tell you whether to withdraw or not, but we can certainly talk through your grades and explain how things go um, with regard to how you're doing in the class. Okay, so the FYE site um, has all of the schedules on there. In addition, under resources, you're going to find that we have posted all of the, uh, the books. So these are the books for 1300, 1321, and 1322. For this class, there is a Java, Java, Java book from Trinity College, and also a Fundamentals of Computer Programming with C Sharp, depending on which language you're in. You're going to look at one of those two books for the course. Uh, they are free. You don't have to buy anything. Um, the lecture slides and videos are all linked in here. And so the lecture slides for all three of the classes are linked. And so at the moment, we are doing Welcome to FYE, which is module number zero. Um, next week, we'll be, or, and starting later this week, we'll be doing module number one, uh, where we'll do parts one and two, and so on and so forth throughout the semester. So you'll look at the schedule, and it will inform you as to which module you're covering each week. And so that is how you will know what slides you should be looking at. In addition, at the top here is this link to lecture videos. And when you pop that open, it's going to send you to a YouTube playlist. Um, and that playlist is going to have all of the videos, including the one that you're currently watching. So that video, um, each of the slides has one or more videos. The videos are actually broken up by topic just to keep them a little bit shorter. Um, and so if there's a particular topic that you want to review, you can come in here and you can find the video that you want and then you can click play and away you go and you watch it. Um, so that's all of the videos. So they're linked up here. Also, if you needed something from 1321, all of the videos for it are still up here as well. If there was something you needed to go back and review or anything like that. All right. The other thing that you will find on the FYE site is you'll find the office hours. Uh, this isn't fully populated yet because generally uh, the first week is when we fill all this in. But in here, you'll see the office hours for each of the instructors. Um, for most of us, the office hours are going to be either in person or online. And so we'll either provide you with a link or we'll provide you with an email address to email to get the link. And this will tell you what times you can come by. Um, all the instructors share an office for FYE. We're on 353D in the atrium building. So if you're familiar with the atrium building, there's the big spiral staircase in the middle. If you go all the way to the top of that staircase and you take a right and go down the hallway and then take an immediate left, you'll see 353D right there and all of the instructors are in there. Regardless of which instructor you find, even if you have, like, let's imagine you have me as your instructor. If you go into that room and I'm not available, any of the other instructors that are in there, they all teach FYE so they can help you with any questions as well. Um, we all work together. We're all a team. There's multiple lecture sections of 1321 and 1322 happening. And so anyone in there should be able to help you with your questions. In addition, your lab GTAs will also have office hours. And those will likewise be posted here once we get all of that filled in. Um, but you can meet with your lab GTA. They're actually in the office that's directly at the top of the stairs. When you come out of the top of the stairs, there's an office 352 that is facing you. And that office is where all the GTAs hang out. And likewise, even if your GTA is not there, a different GTA can help you. And then if none of that is happy for you, if you don't like meeting with us because we're big and scary, or you don't like meeting with your GTA because they're big and scary, then your other option is to click this tutoring link down here. 
So the College of Computing offers a tutoring service that is free. Um, all you have to do is come to this link, click schedule an appointment. It'll ask you a couple of questions about like what course you're trying to schedule an appointment for. And then you'll get a 30 minute sit down with it one on one with a tutor in the tutoring center. The tutors are generally people who have taken 1321 and 22 in a previous semester and did well. And now they're here to help you. So if you have questions, the tutors are the least scary part of asking a question because you can just go and sit down one on one with any tutor and get some help. If you can't schedule it or you need something more urgently, you can also walk into the tutoring center. It's located on the second floor of the atrium building. Um, when you come off the stairs, turn left and then go down that hallway and you'll see it on the right. Um, that tutoring center is open most of the day and into the evening um, and also some, some amount on the weekends. Um, you can just pop in and they'll take you first come first served around the scheduled appointments. So you can do it either way. Um, so the tutoring is available. It's a great resource. And also we will give you extra credit. Every time you go to the tutoring center, they record that you were there. And if you go in and you ask good questions, um, they will give you a half a point on your final exam every time you visit, um, up to a maximum of five points. So basically what that means is, if you remember the policies about switching out the final exam, um, if you go to the tutoring center 10 times during the semester, you'll get five points of extra credit on your final exam, and that extra credit gets added on before we do any of the substitutions. So if, for example, you had gotten a, a zero on test one, but you go to the tutoring center and you get a 90 on the final, you'll now have a 95 on the final, and that 95 will replace the zero for test one, which is really going to make a huge difference in your grade. So we strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you use the office hours for your instructor, the office hours for your GTA, the tutoring center, and some semesters will post an announcement about it if they're happening this semester. We also have recitations, which is again, just a smaller group that's meeting to discuss any part of the class that you're having problems with. So there's lots and lots of resources out here, and it's really important that you use those resources. If you're sitting in the back of the class and you're just lost and you don't know what's going on, then you're doing it wrong. You need to come and ask questions. That's the whole point. That's why you paid for this class. It's to come and talk to people and figure out what's going on. And all of us are here to help you. There are six instructors. There are 10 GTAs. There are, I think it's like 40 people in the tutoring center that are there to help people. So there is more than enough resources out there to help you. You should never feel like you're lost in this class. Come and ask questions. All right, so running through the FYE site, we've talked about the schedule. We've talked a little bit about the resources page where you can find the uh, book, the syllabus, or sorry, the book, the um, lecture slides and the videos. We also have old exams linked on here. We have information about your IDEs. There's some practice banks of questions. There's some other videos from other instructors who've taught the class in the past. So there's lots and lots of information out here to help you get through the class. Um, and then finally, I'll mention there's also the policies page which explains our policy on academic misconduct, on SDS accommodations, on late work, which we don't accept, um, as well as uh, grade requests, regrade requests, that's hard for me to say, regrade requests, um, absences, attendance, proctored exams, communication policy, and behavior. If you have any questions about policies, here's where you should start, and then obviously you can ask your instructor. Okay, so all of that was the FYE webpage. Um, very important, you're going to use it throughout the semester, so make sure you're familiar with it and you probably want to go ahead and bookmark it. And again, the address for all of that was ccse.kennesaw.edu slash FYE. That page is available day and night, and most of the information is also linked in the D2L shell. So you can also go to the D2L shell and click on content, and there's links there back to the FYE site if you're having these. Okay, so why are you here? Well, you're probably needing to make a B in this class. Um, for 1322, if you are a computer science major or software engineering major um, or um, cybersecurity or IT, um, most of the majors, and it varies slightly between them, but most of the majors require that you make a B to move on from this class. Um, specifically in CS, you can't register for 3305, which is data structures, without getting a B in here. In software engineering, we also require a B, although I don't remember what the follow-up course is that you're going to take. Um, IT does not anymore require a B. They used to require a B, um, but um, it just depends on your catalog and also on your um, degree. So make sure you understand what your requirements are. But that's probably the main reason that you're here is because, well, it's required to move forward in your degree. So that's great. 
we have a mixture of different people in here. Most of them are going to be CS software engineers, um, but we also have cybersecurity folks, some math folks, and so on, so on and so forth. The main reason that you are doing this class is to learn how to program. The point of the FYE program, CSE 1321 and 1322 for most people, is that it teaches the fundamentals of programming. By the end of 1321, you understand probably half of the programming concepts. By the end of 1322, you'll understand the other half of the concepts. And what I mean by that is at the end of 1322, you really do know how to program. There's lots of new stuff that you'll learn past this point with specific frameworks and specific um, technologies that you might want to incorporate. But the basics of programming, of how you actually go about programming, is taught in 21 and 22, and to some extent in 3305 if you're a CS major. So really what we're saying here is when you go for your job interview to get your development job or to get your program uh, manager, or project manager, or whatever other job you might be applying for, if they ask you coding questions, pretty much guaranteed that the coding questions are going to be stuff that you learned in 1321, 1322, and maybe a smidge in 3305. So it's very important that you actually understand these concepts. The reality is people sometimes work their way through this class and they grow to love programming. Sometimes they grow to hate programming. It just depends on, on the individual person and what their interests are. But if your plan is to go down a path where you're going to become a developer, where you're going to become a um, coder, where you're going to become a project manager, or you're going to work in a software development company of some form, then these concepts are the parts of the programming that you are really going to need to understand. So it's not just that we're teaching this because it's fun to teach, and it certainly is fun to teach, and I love doing this, but the main reason that we're doing this is to prepare you for your job interviews. Because when you walk in, they're going to hand you a pen or they're going to hand you a laptop and they're going to ask you to code right in front of them. And if you can't do that, you're not going to get the job. It's as simple as that. And the types of questions they're going to ask are pretty much identical to the types of questions that we ask in our labs and in our assignments. I personally worked in industry for many years before I came here. And during that time, I ran the interviews for our company, publicly traded company. And the types of questions that we asked are exactly the types of questions that we ask on the labs and on the assignments and on the final exam here. So this material is important for you to understand if you're wanting to go past this point and get a job. We are preparing you for a job interview. That's really a big part of what's going on in here. And every topic that we cover in 21 and 22 are going to be things that you are going to get asked for. All right, so 1322, and again, if you're familiar with 21, you're probably familiar with this. There are two parts to 1322. There is the programming part and there is the problem solving part. The programming part mostly happens in the lab. Hopefully by now you know that you have registered for a lab and a lecture, CSE 1322 and 1322L. Each of them has a section number. For 1322, the lecture portion, there is an 01, an 02, and a W01 this semester. For the lab sections, however, each of the labs will either have a W, I'm sorry, it will either have a J in it or it will have a pound sign or a hash sign in it. If it has a J in your section name, then you have signed up for a Java lab and everything must be done in Java. All of your coding, all of your assignments, all of your labs and your tests all have to be submitted in Java. If you are signed up for a section that has a pound sign in its name or a hash sign in its name, then you are signed up for a C sharp section. And in that case, all of your assignments, labs, and tests must be submitted in C-sharp. If you don't think that you are in the correct section, right now, in this first week, you're still during drop add, and you can drop the class and re-add a different section. I would strongly recommend that you work with an advisor if you're going to do that. So I would schedule the time with an advisor very quickly and go figure that out if you need to switch. Most of the degrees have a recommendation as to which lab you should be taking, and so you should follow that recommendation. If you are a CS major, then you probably are supposed to be taking Java. If you're a game development major, you're probably supposed to be taking C Sharp. And for anything else, you need to look and see um, and talk to an advisor as to which one you're supposed to be in. So make sure you are in the correct lab section. This is the only week in which you can fix it. If there's a W in the section name, then that implies that it's an online lab. And much like the online lecture, they are asynchronous, which means you will not be meeting with a TA in person. Your TA will be contacting you through the D2L shell, sending you videos to help you get started. And then you'll be pretty much on your own while you're doing stuff with just asking questions. 
So make sure you understand which section you're, you're um, registered for and make sure that you're taking the one that you want to take. All right. Um, as you are uh, taking the lab, that's where you're going to do most of your programming. In the lecture, we're going to talk about the topics, and we're certainly going to show you coding in lecture, but you're not actually going to be submitting any code for lecture. All of the code that you submit for your assignments and your tests is going to happen in the lab. So in the lecture, what we're doing is we're teaching you the concepts. We're showing you how to do it. We're showing you how to approach the problems, how to solve more complex problems. So we're showing you the problem solving aspects of it. Um, and hopefully between the two parts of the class, you're getting both of that information. All right, so how do you succeed in CSE 1322? Well, there's lots of stuff available. I've covered that already. You've got the books, the slides, the videos. You have your instructor. You have your GTA. You have the tutoring center. All of those resources you should absolutely use. You need to keep up with this class. I can't stress this enough. 1322, it's not that the material is harder than 1321. It's just different. If you've taken an APCS class and you just didn't get enough credit and you're that's why you took 21, you probably found 21 relatively easy. 22 is going to cover material that you probably haven't seen. And the pace, as a result, is going to be fast. If you have a problem and you fall behind, you're going to have a very hard time catching back up in this class. So make sure that you are getting everything done ahead of time, that you're not leaving the labs, the assignments, and the quizzes till the last minute. Start everything at the beginning of the week and work your way through it. This has a couple, there's a couple of reasons for doing this. One, it takes away some of the stress. Leaving everything till Sunday and then trying to get it done makes your Sundays miserable. And also, you're going to be stressed out trying to get everything turned in at midnight because the quizzes, the labs, and the assignments are all due at midnight on Sunday. So don't leave it till midnight. You have an entire week to do it. The second reason is if you run into a problem, or let me phrase this differently, when you run into a problem, on Sunday night at midnight, there's no one to turn to. You're just there by yourself and it just sucks. On Monday, you can come into lecture and you can ask a question, or on Tuesday. You can go to your lab, maybe it's on Wednesday, and you can ask your GTA there while you're in lab. You can schedule a tutoring session for Wednesday night or for Thursday morning, and you can meet with a tutor and help get through that. You can come to office hours for the TA or for the instructor. So there are many, many resources available, and if you give yourself time, you'll be able to avail of those. If you don't give yourself time, you're just it's just tough luck if you don't understand the material because there's no one to ask. The second reason that I say don't leave anything to the last minute, I guess the third reason, is because if you get leave it to the last minute and something goes wrong, there's nothing you can do to fix it. I've had students who tell me that their power went out at 11.58 and they weren't able to turn in their lab or their quiz. Too bad, so sad, you get a zero. Um, plan accordingly. You're an adult. If you left it to the last minute and something goes wrong, that's on you. Your dog jumps up and disconnects the power cord from the wall and your laptop goes down or your computer goes down. I don't care. This is your problem. You left it to the last minute. So as a result, you now deal with that ramification. So we don't accept late labs. We don't accept late assignments. We don't accept late quizzes and we don't accept late tests. If anything goes wrong, it's on you to make sure that you gave yourself enough time to be able to sort that problem out. So do not leave anything till the last minute. Make sure you're starting everything at the beginning of the week, and you'll be able to get through this class with no problem. If you leave everything till the last minute, you'll have a miserable time, and honestly, the chances are you won't pass the class. People who leave everything till the last minute end up getting caught out by random things that happen, and then they're like, it's all unfair, and I don't understand why I failed. And it's like, well, I do, and it's what I told you at the very beginning. All right, the second thing is practice, practice, practice. Every time that you watch the lecture, whether it's in person or whether it's in the video, the person who's doing the lecture understands this material. Turns out that's how we got the job. So it's very easy for us to show you recursion or for us to show you file IO or internet sockets. We understand what we're doing. And so when you're watching the video, it's very, or you're in lecture, it's very easy to sit there and be like, yep, got it. This is easy. I got it. Because what you're watching all makes sense. When you will figure out that it didn't make sense is when you sit down to actually try and code it because that's when the moment changes from you just watching something passively to you actively having to try and figure it out. And this is why you have labs and assignments and quizzes every week. It's to force you to actually sit down and try to think about it. If you go to tutoring or you go to somewhere else and you get help with the assignment, you do not want them to give you the answer. 
the tutors should not be giving you the answers, so that's the first thing. But having someone else tell you how to do it and giving you the answer is not actually teaching you anything. The only way you're going to learn this material is for you to figure it out. The tutors can send you down the right path, the instructors and the lab TAs can send you down the right path, but I know that I can do all of the assignments in all of the labs. That's not the question here. The question is, can you? Because when you get to your final exam, when you get to test one, test two in lecture or the final and midterm in lab, you're going to have to do it by yourself with no help from anyone else. So it's great to get help as you're going through the class, and I encourage that. But make sure that if you got help from somebody, that you actually do understand it and try to do another example that is similar to the example that you just did and make sure that you're able to accomplish it. If you are, you're going to do great on the tests. If you still don't understand it and you just get it turned in, you're going to do miserably on the tests. And since the test counts so much, you're not going to be able to pass the class. The final comment on this page is to not be ashamed to ask questions. This is something that we deal with all the time. It's embarrassing to admit that you don't know something for anybody, whether you're a student or an instructor, you're probably going to see at some point during the lecture, your instructor is going to make a mistake on the on code, or they're going to have to look something up. Because it turns out we don't know everything, and nor do you, and that's okay. The whole reason you're in this class is to learn the material. It's expected that you don't understand the material at the start of the class. It's expected that as we go through things, you will have questions. I will never and none of the instructors in FYE will ever be upset at you for asking a question about the material. If you come to us and you ask it, we're actually excited to go through and explain it to you. That's why we're here. It's what we do. It's what we love. So come and ask questions to your instructor, to your GTA, to the tutors. We are all here to ask or to help. If you are sitting around being lost and you're having a miserable time with the class, that's on you. You have all the resources available. Use them come and ask questions, come talk to us, and we will help you with some with any of the material that you're having trouble with. It is okay to ask questions. It's actually expected that you ask questions. So please come to office hours, come to um, tutoring center, come and ask any of the questions or just send an email. Which brings us to how to, the commun how to communicate with us. If you have questions about a lab, an assignment, you should start with your lab GTA. The reason for this is there are only 40 students in each lab section, except for some of the online ones, which may be a little bit bigger than that. However, every lecture has 120 students. So each one of the FYE instructors is teaching around 500 students a semester. So it's hard for us to keep up with everything. And we may not necessarily know the content of the lab or the assignment, because that's not something that we deal with. But the lab assistants, the GTAs, they are intimately familiar with the labs and the assignments, and we'll have an, an answer for you much faster. So if you have a lab or an assignment question, or you have a grading problem in your lab, you need to start with the lab GTA. If you can't get to the lab GTA, you can send them an email, you can ask them during lab, or you can go to their office hours. Those are the three ways to get to the GTAs. If you have a problem with the GTA, or you're having an issue, or there's something that you, you can't sort out with your GTA for whatever reason, then you can certainly come to your lecture. Uh, your lecturer has also got office hours, they can answer emails, and they also are around in lecture. And it's not necessarily that the GTAs might not be, um, you may have a problem with your GTA because of something that's going on. It may just be that you're having a hard time reaching them or your lab is at the beginning of the week and you're not getting an answer back from them um, today and it's easier to ask the instructor. So we can help with problems, but we don't, not all of the instructors will have access to all of the grades for the lab. So if it's a grading question, you really do need to go to the GTA. All right. In your lab, there is a slight weirdness, which is when you registered for the lab, one of the FYE instructors was listed as the instructor on the lab. But in actuality, the person who's going to teach your lab is a GTA. The GTA is going to be there every week. They're the ones who are going to grade all of the uh, labs. They're the ones who are going to grade your midterms and your finals. So the GTA is most familiar with your lab. The person who is listed in Owl Express for that lab is an instructor of record, and it is just one of the instructors. For 1322, um, it will be um, mostly me this semester, um, but in other semesters, it'll be different people. So if you're having a problem with your GTA, even if I'm not your lecturer, the next step is probably to go to the lecturer of record 
for the um, for the lab that you were in that you're registered for. All right. So how do you contact any of us? For me personally, I do not like the email function in D2L. It actually kind of drives me crazy because you can't email an address in D2L. If I email you using my email account, if I reply to a question I get in D2L, it actually bounces. And likewise, if I send you a message through D2L and you reply to it, it bounces. And what that means is I don't get it or you don't get it. And there's no record of it ever happening. It just never gets there. So I do not like the email function in D2L. And I would ask for me, if I'm your instructor, please send me an email directly to my email address. You can find all of the instructor's email addresses on the FYE site under um, instructors. There's a link there for staff and instructors or something. Um, so usually you would email using the email system rather than D2L. Some of the instructors do prefer D2L, so if they've told you that, then go with that. When you email us, be sure that you tell us who you are and what section you are in. If you're asking a question about lab, you need to tell us your lab section number, which will be J01, J02, WJ1, Hash01, Hash02, WHash1, etc., etc. The reason is, again, I am managing, in addition to teaching three lectures, I'm also managing seven labs. And so of those seven labs, I don't know which one you're in, and there's no easy way for us to look you up. So you need to always let us know which section you're in in order to get a faster response. And then finally, be polite and professional. Even if something has gone wrong and there's a mistake that has been made, please begin with a polite question, and we will certainly try to help you. It is our intent to fix any problems. There is no reason to be rude. Um, so start with a, a friendly and polite demeanor, um, when you are addressing either your GTA or your instructor. All right, all of us, the GTAs, the instructors, have a 24-hour window where we try to respond to all emails. Um, the official college policy is 48 hours. We have to reply to you within 48 hours, um, but all of us try to do it within 24. This does mean that we will try to answer even on the weekends and even on uh, nights, but of course, we all have lives outside of this as well, and sometimes that's just not possible. But you will get an answer within 48 hours um, either way. Um, if you're having problems with that and you have somebody who's not replying to you, then by all means, let me know as the program coordinator and I will take a look into it. However, you should remember that your instructors do not answer emails instantly. Just because you emailed us at one o'clock in the morning with an urgent problem that you're having with your code does not mean that we're awake at one in the morning. We teach lectures at all day, all times during the day and evenings, and uh, we are often setting up stuff in the D2L shell or writing quizzes or tests during the weekends. So please don't expect an instant response from your GTA. They are students. They're taking classes in addition to teaching your class or from your instructors who are teaching many different sections. So that's why there is that 24 hour is what we're aiming for and 48 hours is the max that you can have. Um, so please do not email me to complain that you sent an email to your GTA and they didn't reply and that email was sent an hour ago. That's not appropriate. It will take a moment. Um, all right, so the technologies that we use. Uh, the D2L shell, which hopefully you're familiar with at this point, that is in uh, d2l.kennesaw.edu. Uh, your shell probably looks something like this. It's going to have your instructor's name, their office hours and how to reach them. And then up at the top, um, you're going to have links to the quizzes. So in here, you have all of the different quizzes throughout the semester. Um, and so we can see that quiz one is going to be due on, it looks like um, August 22nd through August 28th. So it's due August 28th by 11.59. And you can see that for all the quizzes throughout the semester, this should match the schedule that's posted online. Um, in addition to the quizzes, you'll also see in here the content section. The content section is where we post information. Most of what's in content is actually just links to the FYE site. So if you're clicking in here and you're looking for something, um, the slides are linked here, the course schedule is linked here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The one thing that's in here that's not on the FYE site because it is specific per section is going to be your syllabus. The syllabus outlines all of the rules and policies of the class. Um, so that's always going to be sitting here under start here in your content section. Another interesting thing in the content section is going to be the test prep area. And in the test prep area, you're going to see practice exams, as well as some study guides for each of the tests that you're going to take throughout the semester. So you can take a look at those. And then the next thing I'll mention is the grades area. Up at the top, this is where you're going to see the grades for the class. And so um, 
you'll go in there and you'll see uh, the grade that each person or that you have made on each of the tests. And also it will calculate for you your final grade in there. Um, again, there's a whole other video in this series that explains how grade calculations work. So go watch that one next if you're having problems or questions. And usually most people go back and rewatch that one after test one, because then they suddenly want to know how to calculate their final grade. All right, so the grade section is in D2L. So D2L is where most of that happens. Your quizzes and your tests are both taken in D2L. The quizzes are open notes, open book. The tests are completely not. They are uh, closed notes, closed book, and you will be taking them in Respondus Lockdown Browser with Monitor, which means that you must have a webcam at the time that you take the tests, not the quizzes, but the tests. So make sure on the dates of the tests that you have found access to a computer that has a working webcam um, so that you can take the tests. None of the tests are taken in person for the lecture, but for the labs, they are taken in person. All right. Uh, for your lab section, you will probably be signed up for a, you will be signed up into a grade scope section. This will happen automatically. You don't have to do anything. You'll just get an email that says you've been added to a grade scope section. All of your labs, assignments, and if you're an in-person student, your um, final exam and um, midterm for lab will all be turned in in grade scope. If you're an online student, you'll still turn the labs and assignments in in grade scope, but your tests will be turned in in D2L. All right, for a lecture, we don't use grade scope at all, um, but you'll take all of your tests in D2L, as I mentioned. All right, other things you should be familiar with, uh, Replit, if you haven't used Replit before, um, it's actually replit.com nowadays, I'll update that, it's replit.com. Um, Replit is a IDE in a web browser, so it means you don't have to install anything. It will work on any computer. You simply go to replit.com and then you can create code. You'll tell it what language you want to code in, Java or C Sharp. It actually supports hundreds of languages. And then you'll just start coding and there's a run button at the top which allows you to test the code. It is very important that you are familiar with Replit because it is a good default tool to use as you are going through this class. Um, because sometimes you may not have the compiler or it may not be available or you may be having problems with your compiler. You can do all the labs, all the assignments and everything in Replit if you need to. It works as a good backup. Um, as a matter of fact, most of the examples that you're going to see in the lecture videos are all done in Replit as well. So you can see that. All right. If you're a C Sharp student, then you're going to install the latest Visual Studio for Windows, uh, which you're going to want just the community version, which is free. You don't want to do the paid version. Um, there's nothing in the paid version that you need for this class. So feel free to use the community version. Likewise, for Java, you'll want IntelliJ. Again, the most recent version. And again, the community version is free and available. Uh, later in the semester, you're going to need to install the UML and Java FX plugins. Um, we'll explain how to do that when we get there. But just be aware that those will be needed as well. OK, all the policies for the class are in the syllabus and on the FYE site. You are responsible to understand and read them. And they are the policies. So don't email me and ask, can I have an exception? The answer is no. Um, because there are, at any given semester, there are over a thousand people taking 1321, and there's usually between three and 600 people taking 1322, and you're spread across multiple lectures with multiple people, we have to be consistent. All the lectures get the same rules, so the policies are the policies, and we don't make exceptions. So make sure you understand those policies before you get there. The most important one to be aware of is we don't accept late work under any circumstance. If you missed a test or you missed a quiz, it just simply is a zero. And then hopefully, if it wasn't the final exam, um, it'll get replaced by the final exam at the end. All right. So as I mentioned, for quizzes, you're going to have 10 quizzes during the semester. We drop the lowest grade on your quizzes, and the remaining quizzes are averaged. And that is 25% of your grade. For tests one, two, and three, test three is known as the final. They're each worth 25% of your grade. If you happen to have a zero on either test one or test two, and it's not related to cheating, then test three will replace the zero. If you have a non-zero score on all three tests and test three is greater than test one or two, test three will replace the lowest of test one or test two. It only replaces one lower grade. The replacement policy is to encourage you to understand the material at the end of the semester and to deal with any problems that happen along the way. Don't blow off test one and test two and just assume you're going to ace the final. Um, I would say probably 99% of people who go that plan end up failing the class. So don't do it. Um, all right. No late work is accepted, period. Let me say that again. No late work is accepted, period. 
if you try to turn in lab one one second after 11.59, uh, which is when it's due on Sunday night, it will not accept it. And if you send an email to your GTA and say, I'm so sorry, I missed it because blah, blah, blah. We tell you you've had a week. We don't accept it. So make sure you get everything turned in on time. This is back to my statement of don't leave things till the last minute. If you don't turn it in, it's a zero. Period. The only time we will accept something outside of that is if you can provide a legal document that shows why you could not submit it. And so I think you can imagine circumstances like that. If you were in hospital and you were unconscious, we will talk to you. Under all other circumstances, no. All right, we drop your lowest quiz. The reason for that is because we assume one time during the semester something terrible is going to happen. Hopefully not, but you're going to miss it. You're going to forget it. You're going to not be able to turn it in because you left it at the last minute. It's cool. It just drops out if you're great. You don't have to email us and tell us that this is your drop. It just automatically happens. Likewise, we drop your lowest assignment and your lowest quiz in, sorry, your lowest assignment and your lowest lab if you're taking a lab. All for the same reasons. If you have a problem, it just automatically drops out. You only get to do that once during the semester, and I would strongly recommend you don't blow off week one because then in week four, when you have a problem, that zero will still count. So don't do it willy-nilly. Make sure you're saving that until you actually need it. All right, we've mentioned the test one, test two policies. Um, you can earn up to 5% bonus on your final exam by attending tutoring and or recitation. So I mentioned this before, but if you go to the tutoring center, each time you go, you get a half a point extra credit on your final exam. You don't have to email anybody as long as you went to the tutoring center and you actually got signed in, you will get the half point at the end. You can't see it anywhere in the grade until the very end of the semester when we load it in. So that information gets loaded in in the last week while you're taking your final exams. Um, until then, there's no way for you to see in the grade book that you have these extra credit points, but they will come at the end of the semester. Um, there's a maximum of five points on your final exam. Uh, so if you tend, attend 10 sessions, um, either tutoring and or recitations, you will get those five extra points. And I would highly recommend you do that, especially if you're having trouble in the class. No individual extra credit is offered. If you email me and tell me that you have a 79.4999 and isn't there something I can possibly do to help you, the answer is no. Your grade is your grade. So make sure that you are doing the best that you can throughout the semester and not relying on being able to come to us at the last minute and hope that we'll do something. We offer no extra credit individually. It is entirely the grades that we just showed. Don't even email and ask. All right, your exams are taken in D2L. All right, so there are two different exams that you're going to have. In lecture, you have test one, test two, and test three. All three of those are multiple choice tests. You're going to take them in lockdown browser with um, monitor, meaning that you have to be in a brightly lit room with a webcam that works pointed at you. You can't have anybody else in the room with you. It has to be silent. You can't get up and leave. You can't listen to music. You can't have earbuds in your ear. You just, you can't have anything with you other than the computer and one scratch piece of paper. You have to make sure you have Wi-Fi and power that all works before you take the exam and you're gonna sit down and take the exam. All right, so that's how the lecture ones work. The lab ones, if you are in an in-person lab, you will take the lab in person in your lab section. The midterm happens in the middle of the semester. It's on the schedule, take a look, um, and you'll go to your regularly scheduled lab time. But instead of there being a lab that week, you'll take your midterm exam. There will be proctors in the room watching you. No webcam is required. As a matter of fact, you have to use our computer, not your computer while you're taking the test. For, the same is true for the final exam in lab. So lecture, multiple choice questions, all done online, regardless of whether you're online or not. Lab, in-person students take them in person during their lab time. Online students take them online with lockdown browser and monitor and will only have access to Replit. They won't be able to use any other IDE, whereas the in-person people will be able to use IntelliJ or Visual Studio if they prefer it. All right, regardless of which test we're talking about, all of the tests, the midterm, the final in lab, and test one, two, three, must be your own work. If you in any way attempt to cheat during that time, we will catch you and we will turn you into Sky. If you're not familiar with Sky, that is the Student Conduct and Academic Integrity Group, and they will confirm, they will hold a hearing, they will decide whether or not you cheated. If they decide that you cheated, you will get a zero on the assignment and most likely fail the class. For example, if you fail, if you um, come into the final exam and cheat during the final exam and we turn you in, you will fail the class because the final exams were 25% of your grade, as is test one, as is test two. 
And if you, there is a cheating problem on test one or test two, and you got a zero because of that, we do not replace that zero with your final exam. It stands, which probably means you failed the class. I will say the following things about cheating. The whole reason that you are here is to learn how to code. If you get through this class and you succeed, you've likely learned how to code. If you cheated your way through this class, you likely did not learn how to code. This means when you get to 3305 or whatever the next class is that you're going to take, you still don't know how to code. So hopefully at that point, your plan is to learn to code in a later class while they're teaching you some very specific stuff as opposed to now. But probably you're going to think you can cheat your way through that as well, and you can cheat your way through the entirety of the degree. Cool. Let's assume you get through all of that. You cheat your way through college and you somehow get your degree and no one catches you along the way. Bravo, congratulations, you're never going to find a job and you'll be unemployed for life. Because it turns out, no one will hire you if you do not know this material. So it's not going to work out either way for you. So cheating is against your own best interests. It is also something that really personally annoys all of the instructors. So we go out of our way to make sure that we find you. And every semester we fail multiple people, many people in some semesters um, for cheating. People who think that they can hold their phone down below the, the desk while they're taking their test and snap pictures and upload it to Chegg and then get their answer back in Chegg. Yeah, we catch you. It turns out we know when you're doing that. There's many ways that we know and we will catch you and we will fail you. It is against policy to use anything during the exam. If you pick up your phone, we will give you a zero and submit you to Sky. If we can detect that you submitted somebody else's answer to a test, and you'd be surprised how easy it is for us to figure that out, then we will absolutely submit you to Sky and you will fail the class most likely. So don't do it. It's not worth it. The other fun part about this is there's only so many attempts you have at these classes. So there comes a point where you won't be able to complete the major and you've just wasted all of your money doing this so far. So don't do it. All right. All of your code must be in Java or C Sharp on your finals. We don't accept pseudocode for any of our tests. Um, we will show you pseudocode sometimes in lecture, but we don't accept it on the test. It's just a way of explaining something. It's not actually a programming language. If you believe you have an error on anything that was graded, a lab, an assignment, a midterm, a final, or any of the tests, you need to notify your instructor within three days, whether that be me, if you are uh, in my lecture, or whether it be your GTA, in your lab, you have three days to make a request. So don't come to us on the last week of the semester and say, oh gosh, I didn't understand and that was wrong and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. You had three days to to um, to submit a request after you get the grade back. So make sure you're keeping up and taking an eye or keeping an eye on your grades throughout the semester and let us know if you see anything that's wrong. All right. I've already covered that. Uh, make sure you're in the right language for your lab. I've already mentioned that in detail, but again, do that right now because you can't fix it later on. I've mentioned the withdrawal date. Um, the calendar that I pulled up is there for the academic calendars. Make sure that you understand that. All right, so in the end, the final advice is make sure that you don't just sit in lecture. You're actually practicing and doing all of this. If you don't understand the material, ask people for help and try again and again. For most of this stuff, there is a certain amount of you just kind of have to bang your head against a wall until you figure it out. It is the normal way that everybody learns to code. It is not usually intuitive. There are very few people in the world who in their first programming class are able to sit there and be like, oh yeah, that all makes perfect sense and actually really be able to do it. Most everybody, and I do mean pretty much everybody, is going to have to sit down and actually try it and keep practicing over and over again. In addition to the labs and the assignments that we do in here, there are hundreds of resources online. There are YouTube videos where people teach you how to code. You can certainly watch any of them. There is Kahoot, there is Khan Academy, and all these other people who put out practice um, things that you can do. There are challenges. If you type in Coding Challenge Java or Coding Challenge C Sharp, you'll find websites where there's hundreds of challenges you can do, and you're trying them against other people. There is lots and lots of resources out there in the world that you can get to. If you are having a hard time with the topic, the answer is to keep practicing, keep asking questions, and get to the point where you understand them. Follow the assignment's directions and make sure that you turn them in. All right, so this one is a stupid sounding one, but please make sure you actually read the instructions before you complete the lab. Um, if you type a lab up that is not the lab you were asked to type, turns out you're going to get a zero on it. <laughs> so make sure you understand what's being asked. 
Make sure that you match the sample output that we give you in the labs and the assignments and the exams. If you don't match it, you're not going to get full credit. So make sure you're actually understanding what's being asked. This is not just because we're being difficult. It's also how it works in the real world. When you work at a company, they're going to give you requirements that you have to code to. And if you don't code to those requirements, it's wrong and you're going to be made to do it again or fired. If you don't understand something, reach out and help. Start everything early, read the textbook and practice some more. All right. And the final comments in here are, we care. I know that people say, oh, you know, it's just I had this class and it was really hard and I didn't understand anything. That's on you. Come and ask us questions. All of us are here to help you. We want you to succeed. We want you to find a job at the end of this. We want you to learn how to code and we want you to come out of this class loving coding. Problem solving is one of the most rewarding things you can do in life. Even if you don't end up being a developer, the concepts that you learn in here about taking a bigger problem and breaking it down into smaller problems, abstraction, and all of those topics, those are life lessons that are useful for everything. You could be taking a math exam, and if you are using abstraction and breaking down the problem into the parts that you can solve, solve them and try to put it back together again, it will help you with a math exam. It will help you with a physics exam. It will help you with a chemistry exam. It will help you with problems in life, in your personal life. It will help you with problems in your career and in your job. The whole point of this program is to teach you to think in a computational way. And that's a very, very useful life skill that very few people actually have. So make sure that you're asking questions, you're learning stuff, you're understanding stuff, you're coming to us with your questions and your problems. And we want you to love this, we want you to succeed, and we want you to have a good time as you're coming through here. So with that, I'm going to leave you be, and uh, there are plenty more videos for you to watch about other stuff, and hopefully I will see you around. Feel free to reach out and ask questions. Take care.